Welcome to Experts Dig In with Doggies for Dementia. I am Carmen DeValis and I'm the founder of Doggies for Dementia and I will be hosting this episode of Experts Dig In with Doggies for Dementia with Helene Berger. If you were lucky, you saw part one and if you haven't, you wanna be sure and go back and watch it because it is amazing. Helene is such an inspiration. She tells about her journey as a family caregiver and with her husband of uh, 50 years um, who developed Alzheimer's in his 70s and how she devoted her life to him. And it was so great. We have a part two and that is today. So thank you so much for watching today and stay tuned. Here we go. And what a perfect time, because I think we're to talk about self-care, because I think when you're talking about coming from a place of compassion and kindness and love, you've got to come from a, a place where your cup is already full or partially full, that you're not drained, right? And, and self-care is, a, as you know, is a key issue for all family caregivers and how, how do you balance that out? And, and I know you've got some great input and some stories about that too, Helene. Um, so let me let me just say uh, I mean, there were so many stories I don't know but let <laughs> me uh, that one of, one of the other basic things is that I tried to include him in all the decision making mm -hmm. I come to him with this is what we're going to do but I I made him a part of it and I'm going to give you. A, a, a terrific example of this. And that is that I was getting word from very loving female friends that my husband was saying very inappropriate things to them. And this pure man had a, never said an off color joke in his life. And it was, <laughs> and one night we were at a function uh, when we were still going to the functions. And um, I, I heard it. I was standing right next to him and he said, I'll tell you what he said. He said to, I'll call her Jane. He, she was wearing a, a, a modest, very modestly cut dress. And, and she, he, he said, I'm looking at your boobs. <laughs> and I didn't know how I was gonna handle it. And he didn't say a word. When we got home, I sat him down and I didn't, still didn't know what I was gonna do. My first words were, again, 80, do you know how much I love you? I said, what you said, so when you said such and such to, to Jane tonight, it was very embarrassing for her. And again, the truth, mm -hmm. it was embarrassing for her. It was embarrassing for me and it was, it's embarrassing for you. That's not who you are. I won't do it again. Dear, let's, let's not look back. Let, let's look at the future. Let's come up with, let, let's, let's come up with a secret word so that if you ever do it again, I can whisper the secret word to you. And he was silent for what seemed like an eternity. It was probably a minute. And he's thinking and thinking. And because and I said, if you ever do anything inappropriate again, uh, I, I can say things. And he says, I know, let's make the word inappropriate. <laughs> well, now, <laughs> isn't that appropriate? <laughs> and I, 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 the same, I, was, I was laughing. And, and, and two, two points to this story. Number one, I was so pleased that he was part of the solution. He came up with it and we, we, were, we, we became throughout partners pulling in the same direction mm -hmm. instead of each other. So that's part one. Part two, what was really important, when he did it again, and in the beginning he did it again, quite a number of times, 
instead of saying through gritted teeth in his ear, 80, that's inappropriate, it was, sweetie, inappropriate, dear. It went like this. It mm-hmm. happened less it, and less and less until, uh, until within a few months it never happened again. Mm-hmm. And it was, again, the support. I'm working with you. I'm not fighting you. I'm not angry with you. And, and so this, this theme of, of, of attitude and, and the attitude we bring to our partner or our loved one, whoever, whether it's a parent, or, it is, is so universally important. So and important. Those are just what, three, three of the many, many, many that are, that are in there. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. It's very, your book is so inspiring, Lane. And you know, it, it, it's, uh, you know, our foundation here are my, the three words I started with um, were compassion, courage, and inspiration. And so I, I think that's why as I'm reading your book, I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah, you are talking my language. That's just perfect. And the approach with compassion and kindness and love you know, what a different world we would have, but certainly when you're able to have, when, when some, you're watching someone that you love so much with Alzheimer's disease, that's a rough road, right? It's a rough road, no matter how you look at it. And then when you're approaching it and say, we still have this relationship and this is what it looks like because it's a foundation of that compassion and love is just, it just gives you so much more room for continuing to have a relationship that is healthy for for both, albeit different than what you expected. Can can I add something that I think is really crucial? Yeah. I'm talking as if it's a piece of cake and, 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 and everybody's gonna respond this way if you only do this. Alzheimer's, there's a caveat. I I don't speak now without a caveat. Alzheimer's affects different people in different ways. It depends what part of the brain is damaged to what the brain is capable of. And hundreds and thousands of people who have given loving, caring, devotion to a mate and still ended up with someone who doesn't recognize them or who is abusive and or can't speak. And so I can only say that the the things that I talk about can only help. They can't hurt. Yes. Oh, yeah. And this does not guarantee in any way, shape or form that other people will walk off into the sunset with the same with the same reaction. Yeah. How I wish it did. You're totally right about what you're saying. And You know, I remember people bringing in the list of, you know, characteristics and they said, well, why doesn't my wife respond this way? It must not be this. And to explain that how the brain works and what we probably know like this much about how the brain works, even at our best for scientists, right? The brain is so complex and, and how it works with regard to emotions and things. And yeah, I, I think what, a, what another great segue into self-care because you made, and I did some screenshots about the guilt that in caregiving, because there you are trying to do your best and most people feel kind of alone or if they're comparing, they're like, oh my gosh, I don't think I'm doing as well. And I didn't even realize that as a caregiver until I left to write a book and I started talking to people and they would tell me and I said, why didn't you never shared this in the office with me? And they said, oh my gosh, I thought you would think less of me. Or I just felt so shameful about admitting that I'm struggling. Or uh, maybe it, some even said, I thought that you would recommend placement and I really wanted to try to make it work at home. And I thought, wow, no matter whatever what, that that was a predominant thought even though that my whole my whole plan with them was making it at home making it work for them at home and so would you like to talk a little bit about the guilt associated caregiving guilt because I know you addressed it in your book a bit um sure <laughs> uh, no matter no matter how hard we try we always feel we're not doing enough. And in the beginning, uh, you've got the picture of who Wadey was. He would encourage me to go on living. 
But in the beginning, um, if I did go out to the ballet with a friend, uh, I felt guilty. And we all do. How can I leave him, even though he was in the hands of Lissette <laughs> for the evening? Um, and I finally, um, and maybe I, I continued to speak on the phone to the, that psychiatrist who lived, not now, by the Graben. And she absolutely made me understand that if I feel trapped, if I cannot go out, and, and there are, later we'll talk about ways of taking care of yourself, but she absolutely wiped that guilt away from me. And I mean, I, I was guilty about, felt guilty. I, 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 this is crazy. I, I felt guilty in the beginning when I was putting, heaping on the praise because it, it, it was over the top, like when he would remember a name. And then I thought, you know, I, I said, are you doing this for yourself or for him? And I said, no, you're doing it for both of you. Mm-hmm reaction was so um was so strong and, and and pleased with himself that uh that instead of just saying you know okay did it but and, and even with our kids when they do something good we don't just assume they're going to do that we acknowledge it we, we tell that was really well done you know and, and so it, these are all life issues there's not there's no uh sign mm-hmm. <laughs> A magic bullet here, but it's just if we and it's a time when we should be thinking about our lives and, and how we how we treat the people that are important to us in, in them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Guilt guilt is uh, guilt is a big issue. <laughs> it's a big issue. It's a big issue. Um, so, with regard to self care, can you give say two or three different ways that you learned that you needed to take care of yourself? Um, again, I was fortunate that I had somebody telling me, mm-hmm. you do not take care of yourself. It will not be good for you and it will not be good for him. And when, I, even in the early years when I had no extra help, when, when Lisette was there, I would go out and, and play a game of tennis or, or do something. Uh, aside from maybe getting, buying food. Um, and I realized that in the last two and a half years, I, I, I needed the help because he couldn't, I, I couldn't lift him. He, he was in a wheelchair and, you know, and I never had help at night. But I realized how different I was when I had the help. And it, and it by the way, the help doesn't have to be a, a registered um, it, a registered person, the nursing homes won't like what I'm saying. It doesn't have to be a registered person, but Lisette had no training and she was by far the most brilliant, most caring person at all. It could be a college student who would go and play chess with him or checkers. It doesn't, doesn't have to be a fortune. It could be a neighbor or a family member, people who give you a helping hand. But when I came back from a game of tennis, I felt it, now it's his turn. And I was ready to give my all. And I, I found how important it was to continue living. I, I, I continued, if I couldn't play tennis, I would get, get out and take a long walk. And one of the things that my doctor said to me is to give yourself time alone. And very few of us do that, even in our normal lives. When I was walking, I used to be walking with a book on tape or walking with a friend. And it's that quiet time of being with yourself and listening to your own thoughts and listening to your own feelings is, is crucial. And I didn't really realize that. Somebody had to tell me that. So I'm telling you yeah. all that. Make well, the, make yeah. the time for yourself. Make the time. I, I think it's not only crucial, but for a lot of us, it's difficult. You know, I have friends that like to just go and walk without because we're so used to being bombarded by different different stimuli like to go out without music or without our I'm an audible junkie myself without our book on on um, our recorded book or w- without talking on the phone or you know just time actually just being just being period and taking in the environment exactly. is is difficult is without doing something else and I, and I think I'm seeing at least 
in my world and people around me and in my practice working with people, uh, I found it, it became more and more difficult. More people were kind of addicted to some kind of a buzz, something going on. And uh, yeah, but what, a, what an important key piece. I used to call it my mental health walk when uh, my son was younger. I'd say, you know, I'm going to go for my mental health walk. And that was like a 30 minute, just me getting my exercise, taking care of me. And so I get what you're saying. And, and it is key. And, it, and it's funny. Nobody ever gave me a hard time about it the way I did in my head to start with, <laughs> you know, oh, but you should be doing this. You should be doing that. But I'm the only one who said that. <laughs> exactly. We, we're, yeah. our own worst, we're our own worst enemies. I think. <laughs> Thinking about something else very early on, another scene um, that the bottom line is to avoid, and this was, we were past that point later on, but in the early, the first year, to avoid confrontation. And I'll give you a very quick magic story. One of the, one of the uh, aides, when he came home, it was that, it was that early, one of the aides, when he came home from, uh, from the hospital with something, um, when I had an AIDS for a short time, got him hooked on, I think it was Judge Judy. Uh, she did every day. And his schedule, one of the other things we did, his schedule was so full of what had to be done at what today that there wasn't time to spend an hour on Judge Judy, really. But, uh, but he was hooked on it. And when she, then she was gone. And, um, um, and he insisted on watching it. And every day we would have a, a battle. Haiti, what, you're too smart. <laughs> you're, 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 wait, what are you doing? You know, anyway, a, a confrontation. Yeah, and that, that's a program that does have a lot of confrontation, right? And he was insistent and I couldn't, couldn't do anything. And finally, uh, and it, but the, the rest of the day he was doing really creative, wonderful things. And finally, one day I came in and said, okay, Evie, tell me how long you want to watch. And he immediately said, five minutes. <laughs> he looked at the clock and he turned it off after five minutes. That was his pledge to me. It was, it was like, what a this guy. Was, I mean, this is, I couldn't, I couldn't believe that it, it worked like that. And I thought, didn't think I would hear five minutes. I thought I have you now, but, but he, nobody wants to be told what to do. Nobody wants to. Correct. Correct. I think that that's a, a, a foundation. Yeah. No, nobody wants to, we're adults. We were yeah. past that stage, right? Exactly. We didn't even like it when we were kids. So and, and kids don't like it, right? No, no. I, um, before we close, I want, I, you know, the book is filled just so much information. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. And I thank you so much. And so I, are we, question, are we going to go on to, because there are other things that are really important. Are we going into another session? Yes. I want to, I want to, yeah, we, we can. Okay. Um, for sure. For sure. Um, okay. I don't care how many parts, Helene, we'll just keep going. Cause it's really, it's really um, wonderful. I want to talk about the drawings. You've got some drawings in your book. To tell me about the drawings. Okay. Uh, the drawings were, I'll tell you the story, but the drawings were part of a whole program of a, a chapter of keeping an active mind. It wasn't one thing in outer space. There was a concerted effort. And I think that's one of the reasons he kept improving and remembering words and remembering things that he could not do before. It, it, even, even, even things like the, his handwriting. The first year, I, if he left me a phone number, it was illegible. The, the, the one was so wiggly, I didn't know if it was a three. It, it was, I couldn't read it. Mm. Handwriting later on, when you hear about the, the notes, uh, his handwriting was perfectly clear. And so the brain was functioning clearly in different ways. But the the drawings that was part of like a program. I tried different things. Mostly I tried to have him do what he did before that he enjoyed. The drawings was amazing. He, he, he was an engineer. He drew floor plans with rulers. 
He never drew a picture in his life. And one night after dinner, I sat down a beautiful new pad and crayons and markers and, and, and flare pens and pencils. And I said, draw something. And he looked at me like I had lost it and said, draw what? Whatever makes you happy. And he <laughs> to draw. And it wasn't bad. It was really kind of nice. And he loved it. And he did it. I mean, I was stunned. And he did it virtually every night. That was the activity he chose. And they got more whimsical and more full of joy. In fact, the book cover, which I have here. Mm -hmm. can, can you see this? Thank you. For that. Yes, yes. Okay. Choosing joy. I don't know if you can see it close up. Choosing joy in the middle is a, is a, a, a smiley face that he, he, he was so proud of his drawings that he dated all of them, signed all of them, and occasionally he titled them. Title. And he titled this one. The title is actually is in the inside because it was too, too much to fit on the cover. Let me see, show you this. The title he called was, if you can, it was Happy Sun. Happy Sun. <laughs> so you couldn't, and throughout the book, when I hope you'll be able to show it when some things, throughout the book, his drawings were whimsical and delightful. Stories. Was there anything that you would have done differently when you looked back? No shame or guilt, no judgment. Just you say, oh gosh, I learned this and yes. I didn't know till later. Um, you know, I think the bottom line is no, because I did the best I could. <laughs> and we have to let all of us know that we're doing our darndest to do the best we can and not to be hard on ourselves. Mm -hmm mistakes sure we will mm -hmm. but 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 we I think the bottom line for me that I usually end with is that we our attitude is everything as I've stressed throughout mm -hmm. um, in fact let me just quote Victor Frankl because it's so perfect. It should have been the beginning of the book Victor Frankl survivor of the holocaust a philosopher, a, a scholar, a, a, an author, in, wrote in Man's Search for Meaning, the one thing no one can take away from you is the right to choose your attitude. And I think that sums up the whole book. And, and we have to remember that truly, we are not powerless. We're not in a, in a Greek tragedy where we know the end and there's nothing we can do to stop it. Mm -hmm. Our actions and our attitude can and do make a difference. And we, we can really choose to live with hope and joy. Okay, I have to break out my favorite prop. That is, <laughs> I, you know what? I think I'm going to take that clip, Helene, and I'm going to play it every morning because um, it is just so, so perfect. A great way to begin, begin a day and to end a day. No regrets. I did the best I had with what I had. Yes, and my attitude was my choice throughout. I have and we do loved, have choices. I have loved this interview. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. I, I had such a good time. You were wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. What a pleasure. You just, I, you, you just brought stuff out of me that I <laughs> tend to wear places where I didn't intend to go. Well, I don't know. Maybe that's my one of my great gifts. I'm not sure. But um, I think that, you know, I'm going to uh, begin the 2021 with your interviews, Helene. And I'm so excited about it because what a great way to start with the attitude and um, with uh, with the let me change that to with the knowledge that we have a choice 
with our attitudes and how we're going to view our lives and make decisions and what a um, inspirational story and uh and, and I am going to integrate those those pictures in there because I love that. And I, I know I can't help but know that all the things you touched upon, the connection, the love, the uh, finding joy in things, uh, the creativity, humor, um, and exp being able to express ourselves and be heard um, are all our basic human spiritual needs that often get neglected by all of us. And um, it, it, to me, I, 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 love, I love everything that you've had to say because I've heard that how that really changed how you, what your Alzheimer's journey looked like for you and Thank for you. Aidy. What thank you so very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, um, I just want to thank you all for listening and go and get Choosing Joy, uh, Helene's book. It's Alzheimer's, a book of hope. Oh, oh, oh. Can I say my website? Yeah, yes. And it'll also be in the script below, but go ahead. Uh, HelenBerger.com. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> www if you wish, but otherwise HelenBerger.com. And it's yeah. spelled all, all E's, H-E-L-E-N-E, -E -E, and burger with all E's. No other yeah. vowel, G-L-E-N-E -E and B-E-R-G-E-R. -E -E yeah, do yourself a favor, get the book, take some time to yourself and just, you know, I did some screenshots and highlighting because that's what I do, but then I'll look back and go, yeah, oh yeah. And thank you all for listening and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>